Welcome to a celebration of Nantucket Sound, our monthly webinar series. I'm your host, Audra Parker. I'm the president and CEO of the Alliance to Protect Nantucket Sound. And for those of you who don't know us, we're an environmental organization based in Hyannis on Cape Cod. And our mission is the permanent protection and preservation of Nantucket Sound, the body of water that lies between Cape Cod and the islands of Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. And this is especially important because Nantucket Sound, although it's one ecosystem, is split between federal jurisdiction and state jurisdiction. You have, well, we'll be back in a second with that. You have federal waters in the center of Nantucket Sound, surrounded by state waters that run three miles from the coastline of Cape Cod and the islands. And the state waters are part of um, the Massachusetts Ocean Sanctuaries Act and protected but the federal waters remain open to development. So the Alliance embarked on significant community outreach to determine what is the best way to seek permanent protection for this special body of water and have for the last several years been pursuing a, a national historic landmark designation for all of Nantucket Sound. And a national historic landmark designation is the highest level of historic protection possible. So we have been pursuing that two ways, one through legislation called the Nantucket Sound National, the Nantucket Sound National Historic Landmark Act, which would be federal legislation through Congress. And we're also pursuing it administratively through the US Department of Interior and specifically the National Park Service. So this designation would essentially protect Nantucket Sound as a sacred tribal site and protect traditional uses like fishing and recreation. So we've built a very large and diverse coalition of support. We have municipalities all along the shores of Nantucket Sound on the Cape and Islands. We have historic preservation groups, chambers of commerce, tribal entities, and many, many others that basically represent you know, hundreds of thousands of individuals. So at the end of the day, we're seeking National Historic Landmark designation to protect this very special body of water and recognizing it as a sacred tribal site. So as part of that, we're really trying to spread awareness of what makes Nantucket Sound so special. And we've been hosting this monthly series, which we call ACONS, or a celebration of Nantucket Sound, to really celebrate the historic, economic, and environmental significance of this body of water. So today, I'm very happy to welcome George Foy who will discuss the history of rum runners and smugglers on the Cape and Nantucket Sound. Um, George has a very impressive background. He's a novelist, essayist, and a native Cape Codder. He's the author of 13 novels, including his latest, The Last Green Light, released just this past May. His nonfiction has been published in Harper's, Rolling Stone, New York Times, Men's Journal, and Slate. He's had a very exciting and varied career. He was smuggled into Afghanistan with the rebel, rebel patrol and witnessed bombing raids on guerrilla camps in Central Africa, and has also worked as a factory hand, an agricultural laborer, and a commercial fisherman. He's an equally impressive education. He was educated at the Sorbonne, the London School of Economics, and Bennington College. Um, and he's also a former, office, former officer on British coastal freighters teaches creative writing at New York University, and holds a U.S. Coast Guard captain's license. So welcome, welcome, George. We're very excited to hear you talk about the history of rum runners and smugglers and very much appreciate your, your time. And we have a, a good turnout tonight. So welcome. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm very happy to be here. And uh, I, I specifically want to thank uh, you, Audra, and, and Peter Erasmo, who helped set this up. And... Uh, Generally, all the supporters of S of Save Our Sound. Uh, as you mentioned, I was I was born here. I was born a few hundred yards away from Nantucket Sound, and it's it's just part of my DNA. And I I love the place, and what you're doing to protect it is really really important. So yeah, I'm going to talk about rum running. Uh, you uh, you went through my my unedited bio there. Uh, it's it's all true more or less. Oh, it was but, um, it was so interesting. I couldn't leave out any of it. <laughs> well, anyway, um, <laughs> well, I'm going to I'm going to jump off. And then when you're done uh, with your presentation, I'll come back and I'll facilitate um, questions from the audience. So sounds, I'm very excited to hear. You're leaving, you're you're leaving me alone. OK, I get it. All right. OK, okay. <laughs> um, cool. Well, as I said, I was born right 
right a few hundred yards away from Natak Town. I, I I love the place, and I and I really fantasized as a kid about um, you know I, I heard tales about run 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 running, and I would think about you know the sound in the dark of dark of moon and calm water, and you know you would see maybe a light way out there flashing. But no running lights, and boats running in the dark, and uh, fantasizing, as I said, about smugglers and rum runners. Because even then, I knew something about them. I had some family in involvement. Um, I, I'll give you some background. I'm sure most of you know this, but just for those of you who might have uh, forgotten, um, rum running came about because of prohibition, uh, the Volstead Act, uh, <clears throat> and the 18th Amendment to the Constitution, which were passed in uh, 1920. And it went on, and it went on for some thirteen years. Uh, alcohol was not permitted to be bought, sold, traded, what have you. It was supposed to make America a dry country, and uh, the, the reason for that was well, there was a lot of um, big temperance movement. There was a uh, the suffragettes were involved because there was you know, domestic abuse centered around overuse of alcohol. People would be working incredibly long hours in sweatshops and come home drunk and and um, violence ensued. And there were good reasons, uh, apart from traditional puritism, to sort of outlaw uh, liquor from the point of view of the, the temperance movement. But humans have always drunk alcohol. The earliest um, archaeological sites have, have um, always or generally shown that people were fermenting grains and making alcohol. And, um, and the rest of the world, in the rest of the world, alcohol was not outlawed. So there was a vacuum there that needed filling and could be filled at a profit. And uh, bootleggers and rum runners uh, showed up to fill that vacuum. Um, and, and bootleggers, of course, were making making bathtub gin and that kind of thing. The problem with that stuff was it often was kind of poisonous. It could kill you or make you blind. Imported booze was different. It was made legally in Britain and rest, in the rest of the world. And it, it, um, it was good, or relatively speaking, good. It came overland by Canada, of course, but it also came by sea. And C, when you're talking about the Northeast, means Cape Cod. If you look at the chart, uh, I'm not sure exactly how it's set up in front of you, but if you look at, a, at a, a map of the Northeast coast from uh, Cape Cod sticks out like a hook into the uh, into international waters, into the shipping lanes. And, um, and it's a perfect place, obviously, to, to as all, those of you who sail boats, uh, to harbor in, to find shelter in, and to, to go out into the into the ocean from um uh, now there's two kinds of sh shorelines that are that are apt for rum running smuggling one is the uh, the open ocean and like the south shore of long island and uh, and like the outer cape and it and that's particularly good for uh, smuggling because um it, again it's open ocean as soon as you get three miles out it's international waters it's the high seas and uh if you're flying uh, any flag other than the American, the U.S. Coast Guard can't touch you. You're you're a foreign national. Uh, three, it was three miles out because that was originally the uh, the distance that a, an old-fashioned cannon could lob a lob a cannonball, and so you would get a, a bunch of uh, smuggling ships of mother ships that would come down from Canada usually or the French islands of Saint Pierre and Miquelon, and they would anchor three miles out or a little over or or just stay there. And smaller smuggling boats would come and pick up booze. And the problem with the the open ocean was that it was, of course, it was open. It was wide open. Uh, it was pretty obvious that uh, what where the ships were and what the small boats were doing, for, and so the Coast Guard could easily pick pick them up. And also another another problem was that there were very few harbors. If you you know look at the coastline between P Town and uh, Chatham, basically the only harbor is our P Town and Chatham. You've got. Uh, almost a, a good 50, 60 miles of coastline there that um, that you can't basically um, run a boat to unless it's really calm water and the surf is good. Sheltered waters are, are of course, uh, they're sheltered. There's tons of harbor. If you look at the south side of uh, the Cape, uh, it's just replete with uh, little inlets and coves and they're secluded too. There were, um, in those days, uh, in the summer, there were summer homes, obviously, that were being built. It was becoming a tourism and summer home area, but it wasn't like now where you have giant McMansions with 12-month, um, uh, you know, all-year-round caretakers. Uh, it was very lonely. There, were, there was nobody around those shores. So it was, uh, it, was perfect for, it was perfect for running your boat into and finding a little cove to unload cases of booze or barrels and so forth. Um, 
as Audrey said, the middle of Nantucket Sound actually is federal waters, and technically, that could have been that could have been considered high seas. In fact, there was a court case that was called Wallace versus the Providence and Boston Steamship Company that determined that uh, the inside of Long Island Sound and and similar areas were actually high seas. And and again, a British freighter coming in there technically would have been immune to search and seizure. That was a, that was a tough one to test, and uh, it, it didn't really matter because people used Nantucket Sound to smuggle, mainly because it was it was secluded and there were so many harbors, and also the Coast Guard was spread so thin. I mean, prohibition didn't really catch them by surprise, but they had very few boats and very uh, very little uh, ability to uh, to patrol so many so many miles of coastline. Um, <clears throat> So anyway, uh, prohibition and and rum running was a was a boon a boon for Cape Codders. Uh, Cape at the time and to some extent now, but even more so then, it was really a boom bust economy. And uh, you know during the summer there were a fair amount of summer jobs and there was money there was plenty of money around. During the winter it was it was different. The fishing was harder. The farming was hard scrabble, and the ability to pick up uh, substantial cash. By uh, smuggling in booze was a, was a big attraction, and I'll get more into the technicalities of it. The uh, the, the ships uh, along the the outer coast, three miles out, were were bigger. They were mother ships, as I said. They came down from Canada. A few came from Europe, but mostly from from Halifax or Saint Pierre, that kind of thing. And Peter, if we could go to the the uh, the next slide, the, the freighter. That's uh, actually the, the ships tend to be smaller than that, but it was the same general design, coal fired, uh, small freighters. And they would be anchored off the coast and uh, small boats would come up to the sides and, and unload unload cases of, uh, of different kinds of liquor. Uh, the more common type of uh, vessel was a schooner. And there were there were, hundreds, there were thousands of schooners going up and down the Northeast and, and into Nantucket Sound and around the Cape. And this is a fairly typical one. And she was a, a rum running mothership. She had about 800 cases of whiskey. And as if you can read the caption, I don't know. The, and she had the misfortune of running aground right off the race point Coast Guard station. Um, not good planning. But before the Coast Guard were able to uh, take control of her, the, the, the P-Town locals stripped 100 cases out of her. And to add insult to injury, by the time the Coast Guard got there and the authorities took over the boat, they, the captain said, well, actually, this schooner is British registry, and you can't touch her. I, I'm not sure the legalities of that, but in any case, the Coast Guard was convinced, and they let her go to go and offload her cargo somewhere else. Um, and th the next slide, if you would, there's um, it shows deck cargo on one of the rum, rum row motherships. Uh, these were ca these were cases of uh, liquor in. Uh, they they came into and there's also barrels you can see off to one side. There were three different uh, really forms in which liquor came and which in, in the ways it was stacked. Uh, cases like that, boxes, barrels, and also what they call burlocks, which were basically burlap sacks, but sewed a certain way so that you could fit six bottles neatly inside, and they were easy to handle that way. Um, and they uh, and as I said, these ships would line up uh, three miles off, called rum row, and some of them actually put prices up on the on the rigging, uh, advertising the what they were selling a, a case of whiskey for. Uh, there was a famous uh, mothership skipper called McCoy, who uh, who was known for having fair prices and good booze. And supposedly that was the origin of the term the real McCoy, because he that was that was the good stuff that he was brought in. We'll have a look at some of the, the smaller boats, the boats that were actually coming into Nantucket Sound or coming or trying to uh, offload on on the outer Cape. Um, this is a this is a yacht, um, and but fitted with very powerful engines. And there were a number of these around. And their their advantage was that they they looked like a pleasure boat, which maybe was less um, convincing in February. But nonetheless, it uh, the other thing was that they they had beautiful lines, as you could see, and they went they went very fast, and uh, and they could outrun. They could outrun just about anything the Coast Guard had. Uh, they were often fitted with Liberty engines, and Liberties were uh, actually airplane engines. They were used to they powered <clears throat> they powered um, fighters, fighter planes in World War One, and some of these boats had three of them lined up, 
And, and if we go to the next slide, there's there's um, there's a case in point of a bigger one of the bigger smuggling uh, vessels, which could supposedly go 33 miles an hour. She had Liberty engines. That's not noted here, but um, and she ran a lot in Buzzards Bay. Her name was the Maybe, which which is an indication maybe of, um, of the captain's uh, recognition of the risks involved here. Uh, and the next slide shows the rum runner Maureen, and she had three of those Liberties lined up. And when you think of three aero engines, 12, uh, 12 cylinders each, running at full throttle, uh, the the sound and the shaking on those things must have been amazing. But they could, at full speed, they could they could hit 40 miles an hour and more. Um, so there were the these were the these were the fancy and or relatively fancy and 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 very fast and powerful rum running boats, but there was a whole gamut of different kinds of vessels uh, going from dories, basically rowboats, to converted cat boats, to uh, to fishing boats, there were a lot of fishing boats involved. Uh, basically everything you could see out in the sound uh, that could get to a mothership and bring back some cases or barrels, you know, was pressed into service for, for smuggling. Um, and this, <laughs> and when I mentioned converted cat boats, this kind of brings me to the... Uh, to the personal side of this, uh, my my grandfather bought a house on Nantucket Sound, and a guy who worked for him. and uh, And researching this story, I realized that people were kind of wary about telling all their secrets. In fact, there's still some nervousness about having family names come out in connection with smuggling into the Cape. So I won't use any last names, but my grandfather uh, had a guy who worked for him. His name was Albert. He was from uh, the Azores. He'd come actually come to the Cape uh, on a New Bedford whaler. And um, and his son, or I'll call him Ham, which was his nickname, but he he I knew him very well, and he would tell me tales about uh, running his converted cat boat to one of these schooners and taking some cases off her and and earning some substantial cash uh, in the process. So uh, there's other aspects of the the personal side of things. Um, my grandfather bought a supposedly he, he bought a bunch of liquor nobody knew knew quite where he came from he was norwegian and he did like to drink and he built a safe in the cellar of the house that was uh, it was a bank style safe it was a huge steel doors with a combination and wheels and so forth and he filled it with liquor uh that would supposedly get him through the um through, <laughs> through prohibition uh and and my brother and i kind of emptied the uh, the safe at one point, it had all kinds of junk in it. We found some bottles that were left over, including including this one. I don't know how well you can see it, but it's um, slow gin, nothing slow about it. Um, and we drank some of that. There was actually a bottle of absinthe that my brother and I shared and then tried to kill each other. Um, fisticuffs, luckily we were too drunk to, to do any damage, but, uh, but um, as I said, people are still sensitive about this. Uh, I, I knew, um, I knew people who uh, whose grandfathers had been in gunfights uh, over cargo of liquor, the smuggle of liquor, and who still remembered this and didn't like each other as a result. Families still held a grudge. Where on the Cape did that liquor come ashore mostly? Well, everywhere, really. Of course, the Outer Cape, Wellfleet, Truro, and so forth. And um, uh, Provincetown, I'm, I'm, I think the next slide is of Manny Zora, Peter, and I included that because the guy just has a wonderful face. <laughs> oh no, that's the Liberty. That's a wonderful face too. I'm sorry. There we go. Manny Zora. Um, he, he's kind of the most famous rum runner on the Cape and he was a, a, a member of the Provincetown Portuguese community. And, um, there were, uh, and so Provincetown was the, one of the areas, obviously. Um, on the bay side, there was Sandy Neck. Uh, there was somebody in the cottage colony there who supposedly was a scout and would keep an eye out for Coast Guard. The lighthouse keeper, Ditto. Harbor Point Restaurant in, in, or in, uh, in Barnstable. The abandoned freezer, point in Yar uh, freezer plant in Yarmouth. Uh, in Bass Hole, there was a, a smuggling boat that, that got kind of wrecked in there, and, uh, and all the booze kind of came ashore and... and um, was of course immediately picked up by the locals, but Nantucket Sound was was just as important. Um, there was a bust on Great Island in Yarmouth, where the Feds um, confiscated four big boats, two launches, two dories, and three cars, as well as four hundred cases of Honduran rum and whiskey. And actually, somebody who um, who heard about the seminar sent 
in an email uh, talking about how they had a house in Centerville on the shore or near the beach. And um, and one night uh, smugglers came ashore bringing cargo. And um, I think I might just have time to, to read some of this email if I can find it. Um, and I was delighted to get this. As was the custom in our household, the grandparents dressed for dinner in formal clothes, i.e. tuxedos and long gowns. While having dinner one evening, they heard a commotion in the garden. When my husband's grandfather went out to investigate, he discovered the men unloading crates on the beach below the house. Early the next morning, he found several cases of liquor on the porch and two men in the garden restoring the flower beds and grass that had been trampled the night before. And from then on, the rum runners unloaded crates of liquor at night and left cases of liquor on their porch. These were uh, probably more polite and thoughtful rum runners than was usually the case. Um, Another place, uh, point of interest, because it was right near my grandfather's house, was the Osterville Breakwater. I think there was a wooden bulkhead there at the time, which made unloading easy. Um, and it may have been where that absinthe came from. Uh, there was also a depot in Osterville, which I, I knew very well. It was it, because it became a bar called Sloppy Joe's Twin Villa. Um, Peter, I think that's the next slide. Am I right about that? Or is that, or is that the breakwater? That's the breakwater right there. That's the Osterville Breakwater. Uh, sorry, not the first one, which is just a groin, but, but beyond that is a breakwater. Uh, and that's self-explanatory. Joe's Twin Villa, uh, unfortunately, was the, the building was just bulldozed, but it was a wonderful roadhouse. And I knew the owner, um, Joe, very well. Uh, everybody who grew up there did. He's a wonderful, wonderful guy of Cape Verdean origin. And he told me that the, the he ran the place as a rum depot or a liquor depot during Prohibition. There were three bays in that building for truck, three truck bays. And uh, and the smuggled liquor would be trucked from the beach to there, and then it would be trucked, it would be held there as long as necessary, and then trucked for, to New York and Boston, what have you. The interesting thing about Joe's was that the ladies' room, uh, Joe's, the, the main bar was on, and Joe's, um, Joe Gomes land. The ladies' room and the back, section of the building were on the neighbor's land the late the neighbor happened to be joe kennedy who um who <laughs> ran a bootleg empire of his own and the legend was that uh, and joe combs never really um wouldn't talk about this aspect of it but legend was that the real name of the place was the twin joe's sloppy villas because uh, joe Gomes and joe kennedy had uh were uh, were business partners as far as that went uh Nobody knows exactly how much uh, hooch came in through the Cape. It, it was a considerable amount, but obviously it was illegal. It was secret. And um, and so many people were in on it, including Stades, including the feds. I mean, obviously not all of them. There were plenty of enforcers around, but there were also, it was just a ton of, uh, of liquor coming through on small boats and, and making its way off Cape. And I think a lot of houses, a lot of kitchen additions and it still exists, were built on rum running money. And uh, <clears throat> and of course, uh, a lot of people made a lot of money. Uh, Prohibition is notorious for having been the wellspring of organized crime in the US. Uh, and, you know, people like Al Capone and so forth really built their power and their fortunes on, on running in booze. And the trouble extended to the Cape. There was a, a famous shootout on a beach in Mashpee. Uh, uh, a Cape fisherman named Bill Cummings um, was kind of co-opted and pressured by a by a Boston gang called the Conlon Gang to reveal where the shipment was coming in on a Mashpee beach, and and he had to lead them to there to that landing site at the appointed time at night, and and there was a shootout and several people died. Nobody knows exactly how many because all of this again was was covered up. There were also there were also rum pirates. They were, uh, you know, rival gangs or rival smuggling groups that that were not ethical. And you know, some thieves had honor; these thieves did not, and they would hijack or try to hijack you know, shipments of of rum and whiskey coming in. And sometimes, actually, you know, boarding ships like pirates with machine guns and and killing killing the uh, the crew and so forth. There was a a rum running uh, ship in that foundered not on Nantucket Sound in Vineyard Sound um, off Nashawina Island, and the first this was in fog. The first anybody knew about it was seven bodies were washed ashore on Nashon, 
And nobody ever, nobody, got, nobody ever got to the bottom of it. Literally speaking, the, the the liquor had been offloaded, and it turned out that the ship had two captains who eventually turned up in Havana in Cuba. So there was a lot of danger from other smugglers, other uh, bootleggers uh, involved, and uh, of course there were the, there were the traditional dangers. I mean, anybody who's sailed in Nantucket Sound knows it's a wonderful area for sailing, but it can also be can also be tricky. Uh, <clears throat> as I said, the the John Dwight off Nashawina Nosh uh, may have foundered in the fog. Um, and then, of course, there was the uh, there was there were there were plenty of instances of people um, uh, of, of smuggling boats getting getting wrecked, and of course, their cargo would either float off or sink. And, uh, and which made the locals, generally speaking, very happy. The smugglers had one trick, as a, uh, they had several tricks, but this one was an, an impressive one. They would tie um, um, bags, burlocks of booze together. And if they were being chased by the Coast Guard, they had a big block of salt also attached to the line and they would throw the whole lot overboard. And the weight of the salt would bring uh, the barrels, cases, burlocks, what have you, to the bottom of say Nantucket Sound in forty feet of water, and if they got caught by the Coast Guard, they had they had nothing aboard. They were not illegal. They were not smugglers supposedly, and there was no chase of the liquor. But then the Coast Guard left, and twenty four hours later, or maybe thirty six hours, the salt would dissolve in the sea, and the barrels or cases would float up to the surface, and the smugglers would would take them take them and um, take them where they were supposed to. <laughs> Uh, and then there was a coast guard, as I said. Actually, there were uh, they were understaffed, undershipped. They had um, they did they did they had nowhere near enough personnel and craft to patrol the waterline. Uh, and quite often, in fact, the Martha's Vineyard boys were were known for kind of enlisting in the coast guard in order to be able to tell their friends what the coast guard was doing, where their boats were, and when, and 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 uh, thus allow their friend their other friends to. To uh, smuggle <clears throat> into into Nantucket Sound, into the vineyard, onto the Cape, when the Coast Guard boats were not around. Uh, sometimes the Coast Guard got, got lucky. They busted a British ship, uh, and they found a code book on the bridge. And uh, because there was just the beginnings of um, of radio telegraphy, and some of these ships and and smuggling craft had them, and they had a code and and uh, and of course uh, tapping it out on a Morse key, um, they would tap out. <clears throat> uh, the the question, how many cases can you take? And but instead of saying that, they would just tap out BlackBerry. That was the code. Or are you picketed by a Coast Guard boat? Was almonds, and the code for uh, teachers' whiskey was FEV. Just in case you um, <laughs> you hear these messages on some kind of time warp radio transmission, that's what they were. But uh, the Coast Guard had another advantage eventually, which was that Congress passed a law extending the territorial limit out 12 miles, uh, which uh, whereas three miles before was the the distance a cannon could lob a shell or a cannonball. 12 miles was about the distance your average smuggling launch could travel in an hour. And that was the basis of, of that particular law. <clears throat> and what that meant, of course, was that it was um, four time, took four times longer for a, a, a converted cat boat, say, to get out to a schooner. Which made it that much more vulnerable to um, to being intercepted by the Coast Guard, and the Coast Guard got new ships and new boats, and I think that's the second to last slide there, Peter. The uh, Coast Guard eight. Oh, sorry. Um, this was this was to illustrate, and I apologize for for um, messing up the order, but this was to illustrate the kind of navigational hazards and other hazards that happened that were that occurred with. Um, with smuggling. This was a schooner called the Waldo L. Stream. She foundered coming into Nantucket Sound on Muskegon. And all you can see are her, her masts and sails and, and also a dory and a fishing boat taking taking booze off her. Um, almost three, almost uh, 2,300 cases of liquor. Um, keep going with the slides, and I apologize again for screwing up the order. That's that these were confiscated um, confiscated barrels. Uh, you can see the the G men in front kind of strutting their stuff, and I think there's another another one of people getting busted from a coast from a coast guard ship. Um, that's it. Yep. <laughs>
And I think then the the next slide is the uh, the new Coast Guard ships that they they put into service and trying to restrict trying to restrict the traffic. Um, so the twelve mile limit, new Coast Guard ships, it was it was making smuggling harder, more profitable, and it certainly wasn't stopping it. What what eventually did stop it was was human thirst essentially, and and the fact that. Pro, um, sorry, um, the depression happened and the Dust Bowl and people were, had bigger things to worry about. It also was becoming clear that prohibition just wasn't working. People were getting their whiskey and gin and what have you and beer uh, from smugglers, bootleggers and other sources. <clears throat> and, and even more to the point for the government was the government wasn't making a dime on it. People like Al Capone or Joe Kennedy or um, or Cape Cod smugglers were making we're making bank, but uh, the government wasn't getting a penny of it. So eventually the Volstead Act was repealed. And smuggling, you would think, stopped at that point, but it didn't. Of course not. I mean, there's always there's always uh, goods. I mean, smuggling has been around as long as the government has been able to tax trade. And um, and now is no different. I did an article for the, for the Register in the 1980s, and I, I interviewed a... Uh, a drug enforcement agency, the, the director for the New England area, who said that the Cape was actually the second main smuggling area in the in the northeastern New England in New England. Maine was the first, but if you kind of divide it by the number of miles, the Cape per per, per mile of seafront was by far the the most intense smuggling area there was. And I I interviewed people who who were part of syndicates that would bring in uh, hashish from Morocco on a yacht. Another one was owned fishing boats that were technically sword fishermen. They would bring in swordfish when swordfish was relatively legal. What was really illegal was the the drugs that were inside the swordfish, and and there was there were several. I mean, there, there were apparently, according to the DIA, there were 30, 30 tons of, of grass that they knew had come had come through the Cape and that they hadn't been able to bust. And then, of course, there were all the tons of weed and other drugs that came in. Um, that they had no knowledge of whatsoever. <clears throat> so even in the 80s, long after Prohibition, there was still smuggling going on. And now, apparently, it still is. And this is uh, this last slide is a um, couple of uh, packages of pure Colombian cocaine. 24 kilos of it washed up on Lucy Vincent Beach on Martha's Vineyard uh, less than a year ago. And they clearly came, <laughs> clearly came from a smuggling vessel. Nobody knows what the vessel was or where the rest of the cargo went, but just just as an example of uh, of the continuing importance of, of the Cape in terms of smuggling and, and the kind of the tradition that was not started, but certainly heavily uh, emphasized and strengthened by, by Cape Cod smugglers, how that is really, uh, for better or for worse, um, still going on. There's a, uh, there's a poem by Kipling that that I love that was written in the 19th century and that speaks to the the sort of ongoing nature of smuggling and um and the refrain of it is uh, four and twenty ponies trotting through the dark brandy for the parson backy for the clerk laces for a lady letters for a spy face the wall my darling as the gentlemen go by and the gentlemen are apparently still out there but Prohibition was their heyday, and it was it was much more romantic uh, in the sense that just about everybody would kind of tacitly went along with it. Uh, and I've, I, I, just as a as a sidebar, I wanted to um, mention how I I really got even more interested in this than my family history and would have accounted for, which is I I, I wrote a, uh, my last novel was about um, the working people of the Great Gatsby and. Uh, Gatsby, if you remember from the Fitzgerald novel, spent five years as a crewman on a super yacht. That's that's the novel cover. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> and thank you for <laughs> thank you for the the link there. Um, and uh, and so when he when the novel when Fitzgerald's novel opens, of course he's got uh, tons of money, jazz age, gilded age, and so forth. But the money comes from smuggling and bootlegging. And my main character, he's a Finn from from Minnesota, but a sailor, and Gatsby hires him to run his one of his smuggling craft. And, um, and that's a, that's as much as I'm going to plug my book. But uh, but again, Audrey, 
uh, and Peter and everybody at SOS and all of you supporters of uh, Nantucket Sound and SOS, thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, to do this. And if, if you guys have any questions or comments or massive criticism, please let please let me know. No, no criticism. Thank you, George. That was fascinating. I think it was all new information except for the existence of Joe's Twin Villa, <laughs> which is unfortunately is no longer there. Yeah. But um, I think, sorry. So it's a real tragedy, but go ahead. Sorry. It is a real tragedy. Um, what can you do? Um, so Kathy's asking, how many smugglers do you think there were and who were some of the most notorious ones? Uh, I, how many? I have no idea. I, I do think that uh, probably everybody knew everybody on the Cape, which was, of course, a much smaller community in those days. But everybody knew somebody who was doing this, um, if not smuggling directly, then handling the the, uh, the booze afterwards. Uh, the notorious ones, Manny Zora is the most uh, most well known of them. Um, Bill Cummings that I mentioned in connection with that Mashpee shootout was also quite well known. But generally speaking, and you know, my uh, my grandfather's uh, or my friend Ham was uh, not notorious, but he was uh, a lot of people I think knew what he was doing. And I think generally speaking, that's kind of the rule that in in any given community, you know, you knew Bill and Joe and Sam. They were. They were out late at night on their boat, and um, nobody asked questions. I, I think there were high numbers, but of course, being illegal, there's just no statistics on it. So, the, what was the general reaction of the community to the smugglers? They were filling a filling a need, or they were upset about lot, the fact that this activity was going on. A lot of people faced the wall and uh, pretended not to notice. Uh, a good number. I mean, the Cape being the Cape, I think a good number of people were very happy to have. Uh, access access to uh, to booze yeah <laughs> that i kind of want to hear more about the absence story but it's probably not, <laughs> not a good question to ask i already i already blew the whole secret it was there a, you go okay um ken is asking how did smugglers best avoid detection by law enforcement uh well i you told the salt story were there other other means that was yeah. That was if they were being chased. Uh, the the principal means were that they, they would they would wait for the dark of the moon or, or where the moon certainly wasn't present or else overcast nights, and they would go at night. <clears throat> if they if they were able to, like those vineyard um, guys I was talking about, they had a contact at the coast guard who would tell them where the picket boats were and when they were there, so they would they would avoid that time. They would get there would be whole systems of code and flashing lights or radio uh, that would tell them where. The ship they were going to was at that point, and if there were any pick boats around, in fact, I think well, one of those code names, I think it was almonds or <laughs> plums, or blackberry, I don't know what, was was blackberry. I don't know, was um, you know, specifically, are there any picket boats there? And so, but I think the main thing was uh, was dark of night, knowing the waters, uh, speed, and uh, and and also just being used to the ability well having the ability to outrun these these coast guard boats which tended to be slower and often as i said not not even there i think those were the the main methods so so you mentioned some of these code words blackberry and almonds how did you learn what these what these words were uh, <laughs> i i'm i have no connection to these guys <laughs> um it was in <laughs> that one i think came from the salt book which was uh, which was mostly about Maine rum running, but it uh, but it also had some general information. There were the, the it was that was useful. There's a secret history of Mark, Martha's Vineyard, which was useful. I think the the best source I had was uh, from a, a compendium of register articles long before my time there. But it was it was put together by Jack Braggington Smith among others, and uh, there was a long section about about rum running. There's also a um, an article, a local magazine. I can track that down too. Anyway, uh, and then as I said, just kind of local knowledge and knowing people who were uh, whose grandparents were in the trade, and 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 like I said, still held grudges based on this. So I wonder you know, how they came up with these particular words. These you know, particular words. I wonder why they came up with these particular words, like blackberry almonds. Like what? You oh, know, oh the code. Uh, who knows? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Some of them were just initials, like I said, which would be easy to tap out. On yeah. The, on this key. Okay. Um. Tom says I came in late, but are the smugglers' shipments from a hundred years ago still being found at the bottom of the sea? No. No <laughs> personal interest in that question at all. And <laughs> and the corollary. And where are they? 
Yeah, but well, I, I, I'm not telling you. I know. Do you have a map that you're willing to share? <laughs> no, um, there's there was a uh, there was a a bottle that was wrapped or encased in a in a metal uh, case that was found in a house on the north side. Uh, re relatively recently. And I, w I wouldn't be surprised if there were, uh, my grandfather's safe is gone, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's still here and there some bottles hidden behind a wall or, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know. The, the case of the, of the Dwight, that ship that foundered off Nashawina and Vineyard Sound is interesting because that was such a murky story. Uh, like I said, there were seven dead. They, it, it seems likely they were murdered. Uh, the captains ended up in Cuba uh, supposedly the Coast Guard went and blew up the wreck, but then a guy I, I know or used to know named Arnie Carr, who was one of the original wreck divers on the Cape, found the wreck and it had not been blown up. And who knows where that, maybe some of that booze is still down there. I don't know. Just south of Nashawina, in case you're looking. Well, as long as it's not absent, we'll have to keep you away from that. <laughs> Um, yeah, don't worry. Okay. Julia says, sorry, I'm late. Did you already say how you got the idea for your new book? That came, actually, you know, part of it came from just my fascination with uh, with smuggling and rum running. And the other part came from, I teach I teach literature and writing and I, you know, I teach The Great Gatsby to some extent. And I, and I love The Great Gatsby, to always, but I always kind of resented it because it kind of pretends to tear the mask off the American dream. But in fact, it's really all about the, you know, the, the glitz and the parties and, and the booze and, and everybody having a good time and, and Fitzgerald saying, yeah, well, you know, there's, there's some, there's some bad stuff there, but really let's just keep partying. And that, that was a feeling I got for the book. And I wanted to write about the working people who basically get the shaft at the end of the book, all of them, virtually all of them. And so I, I write about them and I, and some of the characters, um, some of the characters are from Gatsby and the rest are, are, uh, are completely right for that time and environment, including, you know, rum runners and mechanics and diner cooks, that kind of thing. They were the underside of Gatsby's world. And they were the people who kept things running and kept smuggling the, and who actually ran the smuggling boats. And the Daisy that, uh, that yacht with the Liberty engines is, um, is in the book. And that's, uh, they, they were real. It was, it was fun writing it because um, it was like, the underworld of Gatsby was just there for the for the discovering. Uh, I just needed to to well, plug in a couple of people. Julia says, "I can't wait to read it." So you have you have one sale. Well, I um, hope you like. Okay, Elizabeth asks, "How did you conduct your research, especially when there were families who don't want to or too shy to tell their stories? Would this be through connections you knew or someone that connected you to them? Any recommended resources?" And Elizabeth um, is the executive director of the Cape Cod Maritime Museum, and oh, okay. a wonderful yeah. person, great resource. I can I can uh, send a list of different sources I had. I I don't have the list right here, but there's I mentioned a few of them. Uh, as far as the, the local stuff goes, that was that was locals. I mean, that was just from growing up here and knowing people. And and as I said, I was even then, and and even and still now, I'm surprised by how uh, the fact that there's still secrecy around and there's still grudges held and there's still some reluctance to use names. I and mean, I didn't use family names there except for Joe Gomes, who unfortunately is no longer with us. And, and as I said, he made no, he made no secrets about uh, Joe's twin villa being a, a depot for um, smuggled liquor. And <laughs> that was his trade anyway. So yeah. Interesting. He was also, I have to say he was the most upstanding, honest, um, wonderful person, one of that I've ever met. He's just a wonderful guy, and nothing shady or weird or, or even secretive about him. Great. Um, last question. Uh, Stephen is asking, what were the penalties if the smugglers were caught? That really depended. Uh, the cases that I've seen were really kind of surprising in that they penalties weren't huge. I mean, sometimes it was because, as I said, there was involvement of law enforcement. And actually, one of the modern cases of, of smuggling marijuana was, paralleled a similar case in in uh, Sandwich in during Prohibition, where a bunch of booze was busted and put into a disused fish plant. And then with the, with the connivance of local law enforcement, it suddenly disappeared. 
<laughs> and the smugglers were never caught and they you know so anyway there was there was some again it was everybody knew people who drank everybody knew people who were getting liquor illegally and it was an open secret and it, it often wasn't even disapproved of so uh i'm sure there were people who got stiff penalties but the almost everything i saw was there would be some there would be fines and maybe a few months in jail the real the real danger was getting getting killed by rival groups of less ethical smugglers or, or bootleggers okay but i i feel like i'm evading the question but i no um, no i just haven't found a lot of information on that and, yeah, and I mean, uh, basically what you're saying is that there was you know a sort of tacit acceptance of this going on so it didn't seem that it was all that that was strict yeah. and there sense. were also very there were also very tough g-men who there was a guy in uh in new york maine um who who's in the salt book and talks about how he you know how he would bust people but you know the the really dangerous part of it again was was busting gangs of these people some of whom had tommy guns and there would be shootouts and so forth and 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 then the the actual smokers if there wasn't a killing involved uh didn't seem to face stiff fines or prison terms and we have another comment before we close out the book is fantastic. A whole new view of Gatsby's world, expansive and illuminating. Everyone should read it. Oh, well, thank you. Whoever That's that a was. nice, nice thing to end. A nice note to end on. Elizabeth so, has a follow-up question. Who okay. does? Elizabeth has a follow-up question. Oh, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Were there any cases of purposeful sinkings or destruction of rum running vessels by locals? Would this be a kind of piracy you mentioned? Yeah. Um, I'm I'm trying to think. Uh, purpose? You mean you mean scuttling your own boat, or I don't I don't know. It says um, any well, cases of purposeful sinkings or destruction of vessels by locals. I keep going back to the Dwight. I can't remember her whole name, but that 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 large that small ship or large. She was a she was a small freighter uh, off Nashawina. Again, when they found when they when they dove on her, they found that all the sea cocks were open, which is kind of indicative. This was before the Coast Guard didn't blow her up. I mean, again, there's all these little uh, machinations going on that I you, you you really need to be in the know to know exactly what's going on. Nobody ever figured out what happened with that one. But I, the, there were definitely boats scuttled. There were boats sunk. Um, Eliz Elizabeth is clarifying. She's saying the locals doing it on purpose, even if the shipment wasn't meant for their shores. You mean as a form of piracy? Yes. To, yes. to grab the booth and... Um, I'm not sure I to, ran to across smuggle the smugglers. I don't think I ran across a case of that. I mean, pun in, not intended, but I, I think there are plenty of uh, I think there's plenty of wrecks that are associated with smuggling still have little bits and pieces on the bottom of Nantucket Sound somewhere. Well, we're going to be I, seeing an increase again, in divers over the weekend, I think. Yeah, but again, you know. Due to the nature of the uh, of the issue and none of the story, there's very little evidence to point to them, or certainly no statistics. But if there was any kind of boat-to-boat uh, -boat violence, sinking, scuttling, uh, hijacking, it, it, it happened. You can be sure of that because it was a it was a it was a wild east out there. Yeah, sounds sounds like it. That's it for yeah. questions. And George, I really appreciate. I'm going to stop you again. I'm sorry. <laughs> there's uh, more. Well, Paula said that she thought that Elizabeth was asking if the rum runners ran into the moon cussers. The moon cussers being people who deliberately uh, wrecked ships, especially on the Outer Cape. And the research I've done on them, and it wasn't even in connection with this, but was that it's a, it's a kind of fascinating legend. I mean, one, one aspect of it had people tying lanterns onto or putting them on the backs of donkeys or horses and riding them along the dunes so that they would look like a ship's lantern um, following rocking, rolling on the waves, on the waves. And then other ships would see that and think, oh, well, there's plenty of water there, so I'll just go into Nauset Beach. Uh, but the research I've done indicates that uh, that probably didn't happen on the Cape. It might have happened in the Carolinas. It probably happened in Scotland. What definitely happened was that uh, these... The, you almost didn't need to lure ships under the outer cape because it's dangerous enough in a in a nor'easter and what definitely did happen it was wreck, wreck what they call wrecking uh, wreckers would just go and, and take everything they could off wrecked ships 
and that was a real form of uh, of employment <laughs> in some areas. And I didn't see that. I've seen that on Nantucket Sound. There was a little sloop that was washed ashore a few years ago and um, came from Vineyard Haven. And and there was an owner, but he didn't seem interested. And and people were going over it and just taking, they took everything off that. Crazy. <laughs> this was, it was just um, 10 years ago. And uh, one final comment from Jane. Thank you. This was very, very interesting. And I agree. Well, well, thank you all. Thank you. Uh, thanks for being here. And and thanks to everybody who supports SOS. It's a yep. really, really worthy, worthy thing. And the thing I was talking about in terms of the federal waters in the middle of, of the sound, which you talked about, it's 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 important because I reported on in the 80s where that area was going to be used for oil drilling. And there had to be a, that had to be fought. And then there was a whole wind, windmill issue. And uh, so, you know, it's this precious piece of water. No matter what happens on it, legal or illegal, it needs to be protected. It, it is. And it's such a strange situation because it's the only place in the continental United States where you have that situation with the federal waters in the center, totally surrounded by state waters and the state waters being protected and the federal waters not. So it's, you know, one single ecosystem, but just a really odd situation, given the geography, given the distance between Monomoy and Nantucket. Yep. Yeah, so. it's um, fascinating. Okay. Well, thank you so much, George, yeah. for joining us. And thank you to the audience as well. Um, if you are interested in future webinars, I encourage you to go to our website, uh, saveoursound.org. Um, you can register there. Uh, you can contact me if you have any questions, or if you want to get a hold of George, I can pass his contact information over uh, to you. My email is audra at saveoursound.org. And visit our website, learn about upcoming webinars, email us, um, your address if you'd like to be added to our physical mailing list and if you'd like to be invited to any of our summer events. So thanks again, and I hope to see you next month at our next webinar. All right. Thank have you. a good evening.